This is my sixth data update for my date from 2019. And in this session, I'd like to talk about profitability, growth, and value. If you're wondering what the distinction between the three is, well, hang in there. When we talk about the success of a business, it is true. We can measure success based on what you do for society, whether you meet a customer need. But ultimately, if you are not financially successful, you're not going to be able to do any of those other things. So I'm going to focus on how we measure financial success. And I'm going to argue there are three levels at which success is measured. The minimalist level is do you make money? Many businesses assume that if they make money, they're successful businesses. I'll talk about why that's a minimalist test. The second test is a relative test. You make money, but do you make as much money as other companies, other businesses in the same sector? And the third is what I call my value test. You might make money, but do you make enough money? I'm not being greedy, but remember the capital you have invested in your company could be invested elsewhere, making a reasonable return, and you have to make more than that return to create value. So let's start off by looking at how we measure profits slash earnings. That sounds like a crazy thing to do because after all, there is a bottom line in every, every income statement. It says net income. But the way you measure income will depend on whose perspective you bring to the process. To back that up, let me go back to a construct I've used many times before, a financial balance sheet. In a financial balance sheet, you of course have assets broken down into assets, investments you've already made and growth assets. On the other side, you've got debt and equity. If I look at income from the perspective of equity investors, I'm going to be looking at income left over after interest expenses. Similarly, if I look at cash flows, I'm looking at cash flows after debt payments. That's an equity perspective. If I'm looking at the entire business, remember, after all, the entire business is funded both by debt and equity. The income I should be looking at is the income before debt payments, operating income. The cash flow should be before debt payments. So the perspective I bring to income and cash flows is going to depend on whose eyes I look at, that, the, at the company through. With that in mind, let's set up how the comparisons can be made. And this is one of those very simple things in finance that people often forget. If you look at things through the eyes of equity investors, you measure income with net income. You measure what your margins are relative to revenues with a net margin. You measure returns by looking at return and equity, the equity invested. You measure your hurdle rate as the cost of equity, and you look to see whether you can generate value. If you're looking at the same process or the same business through the eyes of all investors, including debt holders, the income you look at is operating income after taxes, the margin you look at is operating income relative to revenues. The returns you look at will be the return on all invested capital, not just return on equity. And your hurdle rate will be the cost of capital. When you look at cash flows, to equity investors, the cash flows will be after debt payments. The cash flows to the firm will be cash flows before debt payments. Now you might say, this is a data post. Why are we talking about all of this stuff? I want to set the table before we dive in. Let's start with the minimalist test. Does my company make money? After all, accounting break-evens are constructed around this structure, right? Do you make money? So here's what I'm going to start off with. I'm going to look at the percentage of companies that make money using both the equity income test, which is net income, and the company test, which is operating income. And you can see that around the world, the vast majority of companies do make money. Across the whole world, about 70% to 80% of companies make money. The Australia and Canada were outliers last year, probably because of their focus on natural resource companies. This is a minimalist test because making money is just the first step in being <laughs> successful. The second step you can ask, am I making more or less money than my competitors? Unfortunately, you cannot compare dollar income across companies because otherwise big companies will look much better than smaller companies. So one of the simplest ways to scale profits is relative to revenues. When I divide profits by revenues, I get a margin and I can get all kinds of estimates of margin. I can divide net income by revenues, I get net margin. I can take operating income and divide by revenues, I get operating margin. I can take after tax operating income and divide by revenues, I get after tax operating margin. Or I can even divide EBITDA by revenues, in which case I get EBITDA margins. Remember what I said though. When you think about which margin to use, you have to decide whose focus you're, you're going to use. Are you going to use equity investors focus, in which case you're going to focus on net income, or are you going to look at it from the perspective of the entire company? Again, let's look at what these numbers look like globally. 
So this histogram, I've looked at net profit margins and operating margins around the globe, and you can see the range is huge. There are some companies that have negative margins, obviously. There are some companies out there that make 40, 45, 50% margins. There are clearly differences in these numbers across sectors. But I've also computed what the margins look like by sub-region of the world. Notice there are big differences across margins around the world. Now, this doesn't mean that companies in some parts of the world are more profitable than others. It might just reflect the fact that industry concentrations vary across the world because margins do vary across industries. Incidentally, at the end of the session, if you go look at one of the data sets I've attached, I've attached margins broken down by sector for companies around the world. So you can see what margins look like across sectors. So in the minimalist test, the question I'm asking is, are you making money? In other words, are your profits positive? In the relative test, I'm raising the standard a little bit. Now, are you making more money than your competition? But let's put it through the acid test. The acid test, here's the question I'm asking. Are you making more money in this business than I could have if I'd taken the capital invested here and invested elsewhere in investments of equivalent risk? To answer this question, there are three numbers I need. I need to know how much money you're making. What are your profits? How much capital do I have invested in your company? And thirdly, I need to know what the opportunity cost is. What can I make elsewhere? In a perfect world, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to measure income looking at what you will make in the future, not what you did last year or the last 10 years. Measure how much invested capital I have in your company. I'd like to know how much capital I've put into your existing projects adjusted for inflation. Why? Because if, you, if I invested money in a project 20 years ago, that money obviously is, more, is worth more today than it was 20 years ago, purely in terms of inflation. And thirdly, for hurdle rates, I'd like to come up with a hurdle rate that reflects the risk of the business or businesses your company is in and the risk of the parts of the world you operate. Now, when you do intrinsic valuation, this is exactly what you try to do. You try to forecast cash flows, you try to adjust the capital, and you try to come up with a cost of capital that reflects the true characteristics of individual companies. Now, since I'm going to be doing this for thousands of companies, I'm going to take some shortcuts. First, I can't forecast cash flows for each of these companies. That would require too much work and too much data. So I'm going to take a shortcut and use a proxy for what you're making as an equity investor or as a firm. I'm going to use your accounting return. How is this going to be measured? With equity investors, I'm going to look at return in equity, the net income you generate relative to your book equity. And with the firm, I'm going to look at return in capital. I'm going to compare the return in equity to the cost of equity to get a measure of our equity investors creating value. And I'm going to do the same thing for the firm, return on capital versus cost of capital. So let me take you through some of the estimation choices I made. And as I, as I said up front, these are very imperfect assumptions, but they're the kinds of assumptions I can make for thousands of companies and get away with. To measure return on equity, here's what I did. I took the net income in the last 12 months. And you can already see that's going to be a problem if you have a really good year or a really bad year. And divided by the book value of equity at the start of the most recent year, assuming that that is a good measure of equity capital investment projects. Remember, it's book value though. It's an accounting number. Often it's not inflation adjusted and it's going to be affected by accounting choices you make. But I'm going to use that as a rough proxy of what you're making on your equity. To estimate your cost of equity, first, I'm going to keep things level across firms to make them comparable and do everything in U.S. dollar terms, which means my risk-free rate is going to be the T-bond rate. To get my cost of equity, to get a beta, I first start with the beta of the businesses you're in. Unfortunately, with 43,000 companies, I can't break down each company into multiple businesses. So I take the biggest business that each company is categorized into and use the beta of that business. For the leverage, I use the debt to equity ratio at the end of the most recent year. I get 11 beta. And for the equity risk premium, I use the country in which you're incorporated. Again, a shortcut because obviously I should be taking a weighted average. That's going to give me my cost of equity. For the return on capital, I use the operating income in the most recent 12 months. I adjust for taxes by using the effective tax rate for your company in the most recent 12 months. And I use the invested capital book value at the start of the year, book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. You can already see that this is going to give you numbers that are off for individual companies, but I'm hoping that across the entire sample, across big numbers, that the law of large numbers will work in my favor and the averaging will give me something that still makes sense.
So I compute this for every one of my companies. So the return on capital will be computed using book uh, using book value of capital and the and one thing about the return on capital that is probably going to make my estimate different than what you see on most databases is I do capitalize leases because I treat them as debt and starting this year accountants are doing going to do the right thing and do the same thing and I also capitalize R&D because I think R&D expenses are not operating expenses they're capital expenses to get the cost of capital I do go through the entire process I just described with cost of equity but to get a cost of debt, I first look for a bond rating. Many of my companies have S&P ratings. So some of my companies have S&P bond ratings. I use the bond rating to come up with the default spread. If you don't have a bond rating, then my work becomes a little messier. I use interest coverage ratios or standard deviation in income, some measure of risk to come up with the default spread for the company and come up with the cost of debt. And I take a weighted average using the current debt and equity weights. And remember, when we use both in the cost of equity and the cost of capital, whenever we talk about debt and equity, it's market value of equity. And my total debt does include leases. So I come up with the cost of capital. I know I've belabored how I've gone through these estimations, but I wanted to make sure I was transparent before I showed you what the numbers see. So here's what the numbers look like across my entire sample. So remember what I've done. For each company, I've computed a return on capital and a cost of capital with all the caveats about the estimation choice I've made. And I've compared the two numbers for each company. In this graph, I'm just going to show a very rough breakdown of what the world looks like to me, at least at the start of 2019. See the red columns to the left? These are companies that are generating below their cost of capital. And a lot of companies generate returns on capital well below the cost of capital. This is not just a small miss, it's a big miss. Then the black column in the middle are numbers within two, where your return on capital is within 2% of the cost of capital. Think of these as companies treading water. They're doing what they need to do, but nothing more. And the green column are my good companies, companies that earn more than their cost of capital. I've also broken things down regionally to show you that there's no part of the world where you're safe. Every part of the world, companies that generate less than their cost of capital, outnumber the companies that beat the cost of capital. Across the world, no matter what you think about my calculation, things don't good, look good on a value-created basis. So what does this all mean? From a corporate finance standpoint, we think about running businesses, it tells you growth is a mixed bag. Too often, when managers talk about growth, we, uh, growth, we swoon, we say, oh, that's great. But most companies, when companies talk about growth, they're far more likely to destroy value than increase value because they're paying too much to get this growth. Second, there are lots of bad companies around the world, thousands and thousands of companies. Some of these bad companies are bad management. Some of these bad companies are in bad businesses. And some of these bad companies just had a bad year. Whatever the reason, though, there are lots of companies which have a tough time making enough money to justify the capital invested in them. And you're saying, this is terrible. As an investor, what do I do now? I have some good news for you as an investor, because as an investor, you have some slack. And here's why. You don't make or lose money based on whether companies are good companies or bad companies, because the market is an expectation game. Let me give you a very simple example to illustrate. Let's suppose you have a company which has a return on capital of 5% and a cost to capital of 10%. Lots of companies like that in my sample, right? Now you invest in that company. You know, if that company generates a return on capital of 7%, which is a 2% higher return on capital than this year, but still lower than the cost of capital, you're going to make money because if investors expected this company to continue to make 5% and it generates 7%, it beat expectations. So here's a bad company that will be a good investment. In contrast, think about a company that makes a 25% return on capital, well above its cost of capital. It's a great company, right? You invest in that company. It delivers a 20% return on capital, well above the cost of capital, but below expectations, your stock price will drop. This doesn't sound fair to you, but it's the way markets work. Good companies can be bad investments, and bad companies can be good ones. And you know what? It explains graphs like this one, and there are variants of this graph you will see elsewhere. And in this graph, for instance, what the researchers did is they compared excellent companies. These are really good companies that met all the criteria for excellence with unexcellent companies as investments. See the green line there? That's what your investment in unexcellent companies will do. The red line is what your investment 
in excellent companies will do. When, when you invest, you're not judged on whether you're investing in good or bad companies. It's whether you're investing in companies where companies do better than expected or worse than expected. My final thoughts are on corporate governance. Over the last two decades, there's been a lot of talk about corporate governance. There are metrics that have shown up, measures, laws that have been passed. And increasingly, as I look at these laws, metrics, and measures, they're all checkbox measures. In other words, they look at things like how many people, how many directors do you have? How many are independent? It's checkbox, check, check, check. And I think we've lost our way. When you ask me what corporate governance means, at least from my understanding of corporate governance, here's what I see. Corporate governance gives shareholders a chance to change the management of their company, a chance, not a guarantee, a chance to change the management if they feel the managers are not doing a good job. Good corporate governance would imply that if you have badly managed firms, the odds of management change will increase in those firms relative to firms that are well managed. It's not a perfect process, but that to me is the essence of good corporate governance. You're saying, what's that got to do with what we've been talking about in this session? Think about how many companies around the world are badly managed and badly run. That statistic hasn't improved over the last 20 years. So I'm cynical about corporate governance. I think there's a lot of talk, but much of it is just legal cover or just talk that means little. Because when I look at real change, are badly managed companies around the world more likely to see change, I'm not that hopeful. So hopefully corporate governance will find its way back to, the, to, to doing the right thing. Because in a perfect world, or in a good corporate governance world, perfect is out of the question, I would like some of these companies, not all of them maybe, but some of them at least, for management to be put on the dock and say, hey, you guys are making a 7% return and you need to be making a 12% return. Making money is not enough. That, to me, would be the day that good corporate governance arrives. Thank you very much for listening.